Well, hello and welcome to part four and the conclusion of our series we are calling At the Movies. In today's message, we'll be looking at a hidden gem of a film titled Wonder. In this amazing movie stars Julia Roberts and Owen Wilson as the parents of a young boy named August Pullman. August Pullman goes by Augie in the movie. And Augie is played by a, a young man named Jacob Tremblay. And Augie, in this inspiring story, is born with facial differences. And we're ju- and in the movie picks up where he's going to enter the mainstream public school system for the first time. His entire life he's been homeschooled and, and sheltered in a bubble. And so this is he's t- jumping into middle school and he's going to a public school for the first time time. Obviously, his world is being flipped upside down. It's being changed. But what's so inspiring about this movie is that uh, even in all this change in Augie's world, he still has an influence and makes an impact on the lives of those around him. He changes the world of the people around him. So let's begin by actually getting introduced and meeting Augie. Let's join him. This is, this first clip is his first day at school. So watch this. How does one change the world? That's such a big question. It's so, it's so large. Is it even possible? It can be overwhelming. Is it even possible for one person to change the world? Well, I believe it is. But in order to do so, we have to get smaller. And I want to go so small as to focus on you and one other person. Now, I want to propose a concept to you that will strike fear into the hearts of many of you. This, d- this type of message can scare many of you. And you go, okay, this just isn't me. I know what he's talking about. It's not me. I'm checking out. That's not really my deal. But let me tell you, friends, that in my walk with the Lord over the past uh, several years, I've walked with the Lord for a long time, I've found that God often lies outside of my comfort zone. I have to s- take a step forward to meet God where he is. And that's often outside of my comfort zone. So I want to propose this concept to you, and it's all throughout the Bible. It begins the Gospels and actually ends the Gospels, and it picks up in Mark chapter 1. Jesus says, come, follow me. And that's Jesus talking to his disciples. And I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. Okay, Samuel, I know what you're talking about here. You're talking about evangelism. You're talking about uh, evangelizing to others. And that's not, that's not really me. Well, I believe it's my job as your pastor to, uh, to 
one, dispel the fear around this subject and to really show you how important it is. And I want to get rid of the fear and the misconceptions and the myths about this. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Uh, I want you to think of some adjectives right where you are. Think of some adjectives that describe an evangelist to you. What comes to mind? I know for me, what comes to mind is some white shoes, a suit, and, you know, they're loud and obnoxious, and, you know, they have an organ playing behind them, and that's what I think of when I think of an evangelist and the, and the evangelists I've seen. Now, I want you to think of some adjectives that describe the person who played the biggest role in you coming to know Christ. How many of them have white shoes? Probably not many. <laughs> They're probably not loud and obnoxious. No, what are they? They're probably caring, kind, inviting. They listened. They had the best in mind for you. That's really what evangelism is. And I want to show you in Mark chapter 6, once again, Jesus at the end of the Gospels, he's getting ready to go back to heaven. He's already died on the cross, been buried and rose again. He's resurrected. And he's talking to his disciples and he says, go everywhere in the world and do the things I've been showing you. Tell the things I've been telling you. Tell the good news to everyone. Tell the good news to everyone. You know, I believe there's fear in this idea of sharing the good news, of evangelizing, because there's myths and misconceptions that, that float around this idea of being, you know, evangelistic. And you know, even evangelistic, you know, it comes up with the label evangelist. You know, those are thought of as people who are far right, aren't in touch with people, are crazy, are overwhelming. But friends, I'm telling you, that's not what evangelism is. Evangelism is being kind, caring, seeing people where they are, seeing them for who God's made them to be. I want to show you another clip from the movie Wonder where Augie's mom actually has the opportunity to do this for her son. Augie's just gotten done with his first day of school and it was really hard. Kids were very mean to him. They called him hideous names and, and were just really picked on him. And he had a really rough day. And so we're going to drop in in this clip to where the Pullman family is having dinner that evening after Augie's first day of school. Why don't you watch the clip?
That is evangelism. That is seeing people as God made them to be. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be caring, to listen, to be inviting. We're called to see the beauty in people. Let me say it this way. We're called to see people as Jesus sees people. We're called to see people as God sees them. You need to hear this. There's people in your sphere of influence, in your life, that you're in a relationship that need to know you see them. In other words, they need to know that you care about them. This is what we're called to do. And let me tell you what happens when we start to see people as God sees them. We start to develop God's heart for them. We start to develop God's heart. It says this in Acts chapter 1 that this is Jesus talking. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, imagine a courtroom scene here, and Jesus is telling us to play a particular role. It's to be witnesses. See, in a courtroom scene, what is there? There's the, the, uh, the defendant, and there's the prosecutor, and then there's witnesses. The pro- prosecutor is on the fence. You know, oh, you're guilty. You did this wrong. They, are, they need judgment. What's the defendant doing? He's going, no, 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 no. That's not us. We didn't do that. Here's, here's the evidence to prove that you are wrong. We're not called to be either of those. Jesus instructs us to be a witness. See, we're not called to be telling people, you're going to hell, you're doing wrong, you need to change that, you need to get your life right. That's not what we're called to do. But we're also not called to be the person who's defending the faith. We're not called to be on social media defending, arguing what is right and what's wrong. And we're not, we're not called to have all the answers either. We're just asked, to, Jesus instructs us what? To be witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness shares their side of the story. This is my story and it's what it is. We're called to share our story. And see, when we actually start to see people as God sees them, start to care for people, what happens is we hear their story and, and they become interested in our story. They want to hear our story. That's not true, Samuel. People don't care about my story. Yes, they do. You need to hear that. Gallup came out with a poll a few years back and it said that of the 65 million people who will not be in church this weekend, 34 million of those people would be in church if somebody invited them. 34 million people would say yes to an invitation to church. In that same poll, it discussed topics that teenagers are talking about. Uh, And it discussed, you know, drugs, music, what are the Kardashians up to? What are the shows? What's pop culture? What's politics? What's going on? You know, what is the, and you know what the number one thing is that the teenagers were talking about? The number one topic they wanted dialogue about was spirituality. Spirituality. What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is that is God already at work in somebody's life. And we are called to to see that and to be a part of that process. To not just be a part of that process, but to enjoy it. It says this in 2 Timothy, that we are to preach the word of God. Well, Samuel, that's your job. You're the preacher. No, that's all of us. We're called to preach the word of God, to share with others, to be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. And I love this line. It's to work at telling. What does that mean? It means we're probably not very good at it. It means we're going to get better at it, though. We are to work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. That means, that last line means that that's what God created you for. That is what you're supposed to be doing. You need to see this passage. It's so important that, you know, people come to me all the time and say, what, what, what am I supposed to do in my life? I don't know what God wants to do in my life. This is what you were created to do. This is God's plan for you. Let me say it this way. There is no plan B. You are God's plan. You are his plan. And he's put specific people around you for you to reach. What happens, though, I think so often is that we overcomplicate this concept of evangelism. We overthink it. Make it, we feel like that in order to evangelize, we have to know the Bible so well that we can argue with somebody and convince them that our way is better than theirs. But friend, that's not it at all. I want to boil it down to four simple steps that we can participate in. And the first one is to become aware. We have to become aware. 
Become aware of what? Well, I want you to become aware of two things. The first is that this is your ministry, as that passage we just read said. God created you to do this. This is your destiny. Let me say it this way. This is your purpose. There is no plan B. God wants to work through you. It says in Romans chapter 10, this is Paul talking. How then can they, who is they? That's They is those people that do not know God. They is those that are struggling, that are suffering, that are miserable, that are far from Jesus, that are not here at church. How can, then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless someone does a message about this topic and says, this is what you're called to do and you need to be doing it and God's equipped you to do it? How can they even preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful, and this is Paul quoting an Old Testament verse here, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let me tell you, friend, you have never lived life until you have invited an unchurched person to come sit next to you in church, and they are suffering their miserable life. It sucks for them, but they're here sitting next to you, watching with you. Why? Because they were one of the 34 million who would say yes if you invited them, and then they're hearing the message, and at the end of the message, uh, we give an opportunity to start a relationship with Jesus, and we say every head bowed and every eye closed, and yet your friend's there, so you're peeking out of the side of your eye. You're watching them. And let me tell you, there's nothing more powerful than when you're watching them and that invitation is given and you see a tear roll down their eye and you see them raise their hand to start a relationship with Jesus. Come on, there is nothing more fulfilling than that. Let me tell you, that will be your favorite service ever. I guarantee it. <laughs> we encourage people here at Vineyard to uh, two times a year, two services, there's 52 weeks. We encourage people twice a year to bring somebody with you to church, that an unchurched person. There's 34 million people waiting for your invitation. So just two times a year, I encourage you to do that. And when they come, let me tell you, that will be your favorite service ever. It'll be your favorite service ever. But we have to first become aware. I want to show you another video clip from our movie, Wonder, where there's this young man, this young boy named Jack, and he takes that step. He becomes aware of Augie, and he's, instead of sitting with his friends at lunch, he makes a different decision. I want you to watch this clip. Because Jack was aware, he was able to be an ambassador of joy in Augie's life. He was able to see Augie. He was able to meet Augie and bring him something. He was able to be an ambassador of peace, happiness in his life. 
Well, we're called to do the exact same thing. We're called to be an ambassador in people's life. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are Christ's ambassadors. And get this, this is so important. Hear this right here. God is making his appeal through us. He wants, it's not God's gonna go get that person, don't worry about it. It's no, he wants to work through you. He wants to meet that person through you. If you know God, if you have a relationship with Jesus, this is your purpose. This is your purpose. The second thing I want you to become aware of is that there is a process at work. You know, Pastor Andy actually shared with me a, a scale. It's created by this guy called Angle. It's the Angle Scale. And what it is is it shows the steps people take, kind of the, the phases people go through before starting their life with Christ, and then when they do, and kind of the steps after that, uh, real broad ones. But the, the power, you can Google this and find it. It's called the Angle Scale. What's so powerful about this scale, how it worked in me is that it showed me, oh, there's a process at work. And really, it, it gave me some peace. You need to hear this. It gives you peace when you understand this is how God works because it, it, uh, it takes the pressure off me a little bit that I don't have to go around closing deals every time and batting home runs and leading people to Jesus left and right. No, I'm just called to help people take one step. I'm called to be a part of the process. You know, that's what our small groups, the whole idea behind our small groups and the Vineyard Network are built, in, built on is that as small group leaders, we help people in our groups just take one step over the course of a semester. Don't have to solve all their problems. We don't have to uh, uh, create a new person. We just have to help them take one step. It's one step. First Corinthians actually lays this process out really well. This is Paul talking. He says, my work was to plant the seed in your heart. So Paul planted the seed. And Apollo's work was to water it. They did different things. Paul planted it. Apollo's watered it. But it was God, not we, who made the garden grow in your hearts. See, there's peace in this. That we are called, you need to hear this, we are called to be a part of the process. Some are called to plant the seeds. Some are called to water them. But then it's God. Understand that God's in the background. God's really working on the whole thing, right? A couple of years ago, I had a friend at the Starbucks right down the road from our church who, uh, I drink too much coffee, so I was there a lot, uh, and I had the opportunity to minister to him uh, frequently, and the Lord really put him on my heart. And I found out through ministering to him that he played drums, and I was like, oh, you could be a part of our worship team. And uh, so I started praying for him. I'd pray for him sometimes. I got to hear his story. I got to know him. And I ended up inviting him to church a few times, and he ended up coming once when I was speaking, and he brought his parents with him, and he actually sat in one of our front sections here in the building. And I, I remember vividly when I did the salvation prayer, I gave an opportunity for people to know, to start a relationship with Jesus, and he raised his hand. He's, I want to be one of those people. And I was like, hallelujah, yes. Now it's time to get him on the worship team. <laughs> well, a few weeks went by, and I didn't see him at Vineyard anymore. Where'd he go? I didn't see him. Well, a couple more weeks went by, and I was back at Starbucks, and I saw him there, and he saw me. He's Samuel. He came running up to me, and we talked, and he shared how he prayed with me on that day and how it changed his life and how he had another friend who ended up, you know, hearing about that and invited him to his church and asked him to be on the worship team, and Nick told me he was there playing on the drums all the time now and loved it. I was like, dang it. That's what I thought to myself. I was like, dang it. I worked so hard on you, Nick. Why didn't I get you on the worship team? We need you. That was my selfish thought. But then the Lord reminded me in that moment. He brought this verse to mind. He reminded me that, hey, I'm called, I'm called to be a part of the process. That there's going to be some I plant seeds in and some I water seeds in. But God's in control of it all. And we, you, are called to just be a part of that process. I love this quote from Sam Williams. It says, evangelism is helping people discover how God is already at work in their lives. What a great quote. We're just called to be a part of the process. So we have to become aware. And then secondly, we have to commit to prayer. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because I know you understand the power of prayer and how it works in people's lives. But you need to, I wanted to give you one of these. It's a little blue card, and you can download this. Uh, we're going to have a link for you. What it is is you write names up here, and there's some verses on the back. And I'm going to cover these verses. But what the names are, look at me, look at me. You need to hear this. These names, the people that go on here, 
is your lost husband, your spouse who's far from God, your child who is not listening to anything God has for him or her. It's that wayward child. It's that relative, that grandfather, that uncle who doesn't know the Lord. Their names go on here. And then you pray over them every day. Mine sits in my uh, Bible at the top, and I start with this. I pray over these people. And what's so powerful is prayer is powerful, but it's dynamic. It's dynamite when you actually, it's power, extra powerful when you pray scripture over them as well. And so you commit to prayer by praying these scripture verses over them. It says in John 6, 44, pray that the Father would draw them to Jesus. It says in 2 Corinthians, you pray this, you pray that against the spirit that binds their mind. Because there is an enemy at work who wants to keep them from knowing God and the plans and purposes he has for their life. So we rebuke that. We pray against that. It says in Romans 8 that we pray that they come to know God relationally. I love this one. Another translation says that the the spirit would loose the uh, spirit of adoption. That the spirit of adoption would be loosed on them. That means that You're praying literally that they would not see God as a religion, but that they would have a relationship with God. Another translation says that they would lose the spirit of sonship. Sonship. That they would know God as a father, not as some distant God, but as a father who cares about them. And then Matthew, pray that believers, cool believers, (laughs) believers who have their best interest in mind, not the bad ones, keep the bad Christians away, bad Christians away, (laughs) that believers will cross their paths and enter into positive relationships with them. Lord, I pray that, you know, even though my son won't listen to me, my daughter doesn't want to hear a word I have to say, that, Lord, you will send cool Christians into her path, into his path, who will be life-giving to them, who will share God's best with them. That's a prayer we pray over them. And then finally, we pray for a spirit a revelation for who Jesus is and what he has done for them. We pray for a spirit of revelation to come upon them. That's the eureka. That's the, see, we can't turn on the lights inside people's hearts. Only God can do that. So, and that's a spirit that does that, a spirit of revelation. So we pray that upon them. You know, there's a spirit of revelation here at work right now in this service. And for some of you, you know that because you came to the service, you clicked on, and you're just, ah, oh, You've got all the gunk, all the life's problems with COVID and so much more. And yet, some of this is starting to make sense to you. That's the spirit of revelation that's at work there. So we become aware. We commit to prayer. And then thirdly, and I swear I'm not trying to make this rhyme, but we show you care. It's a preacher's disease. What can I say? We show you care. And this is my favorite because evangelism becomes so simple at this point. We just do simple acts of kindness for people to show them the love of Jesus. We actually have acts of kindness cards that we hand out now. And we encourage people to do an act of kindness and give the card out. uh, Because we believe that small things done with great love move people in a powerful way. It nudges them towards God. You know, the other day I was out at dinner with my wife and some friends and uh, we were ordering and our waitress was serving us and she was having a really hard day. You could see it. Just it had been a long day. Some customers were probably mean to her. Um, and th- then just with COVID, the health and safety concerns, just causing extra stress on her job. And she had to remember the whole menu off the top of her head. And uh, you could just see she was struggling. So Olivia and I, we decided, we don't do this often, but we decided to leave an extra generous tip for this young woman. And it wasn't anything crazy, but it was enough to say, hey, I see you. You matter. I appreciate you. And I wanted to leave a card. And, you know, I didn't even know it, but I found out that she actually, she didn't go to our church, but she knew some people at our church. So she had some friendships here. That's how God works. God's already at work in people's lives. We just have to play a part in that process. And it's so simple. It's just simple things we can do. Jesus, this was his style of evangelism. In Luke chapter 19, I'm not going to dive into that, but I encourage you to go read it. The first eight verses talks about a man named Zacchaeus. And God Uh, Jesus, what he did to evangelize, to to see him, was to have lunch with him. How many of y'all can eat? I mean, we can eat. I mean, that's Jesus' style of evangelism, is to see people, to care for people, to be there for people. You know, in the movie Wonder, there's a great scene where Augie actually has a chance to show Jack, the friend we met earlier, that he cares for him. There's a scene where they're walking in the woods together and there's some bullies that actually come and they're picking on him and picking on Jack. And Augie has the opportunity to jump in and show him that he cares for him. Would you watch this?
Augie did not have to do that. Augie had enough problems. His life was already really bad. I mean, he was having people pick on him. He had enough bullies in his life. He didn't need more bullies. He didn't need to, he could have walked away. He could have ran away. He didn't have to jump in. He knew he was going to get beaten to a pole. Yet he did. Why? Because he cared. He knew he probably wouldn't make a difference fighting those, those bigger kids. But he jumped in anyways. Why? Because he cared. He cared says this in 1 Corinthians, this is Paul once again, though I am free and belong to no man, though I am not, I don't have to uh, be kind and hear Nick's story even though I got places to be at, you know, that aren't Starbucks. I don't have to be kind to that waitress. I don't have to stand in and fight somebody else's battle. I am, I I belong to no man, yet I make myself a slave. I serve everyone to win as many as possible. I've become all things to all men so that by all possible means, an act of kindness card, an invitation to a Christmas service, listening to somebody's story, praying for somebody, caring for somebody, seeing somebody, by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. What does that mean? That means so that we may live the life God has for us to live. So we become aware, we commit to prayer, We show we care. And then if you do those three, this last one will present itself. This opportunity will present itself is that uh, we have to be ready to share. We have to be ready to share. You know, it says in 1 Peter that we are to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. What is that hope? Well, that hope is Jesus Christ, my friends. That hope is that we had a bill to pay. The Bible says the wages of sin are death, and we're all sinners. We've all made mistakes. We had a bill to pay, and that, that payment is death. Yet Jesus, this is the hope, Jesus stepped in and said, I will pay that bill. He stepped into your life and said, I will pay those wages. He, when he died on the cross for you, he said, I will pay your bill. I will pay those wages. I will stand in, just like Augie did with Jack, stood in and fight. Jesus stands in and fights for you. You need to hear that. He fights for you. The Bible actually says that he intercedes for us actively right now. He's interceding to the Father for us. He's speaking to God for us. He's paid our bill for us. That's the hope we have. And we're called to share that hope with others. Now, for some of you, that will mean sharing Jesus with others because you know how to do that. But for, but for some of us, that really just means if we don't know how to share Jesus, that's okay. Share your church. Invite them to church where they can hear a gospel presentation. Tell them, hey, we have free coffee, hot coffee, and you get to bring in the auditorium. It's a weird thing. (laughs) I mean, share your church. It's as easy as that. Be a part of the process. Invite one of somebody here, and they're going to be here because they're one of the 34 million that will say yes if you invite them. And then when they're here, watch how we change the world together one person at a time. It says in Acts chapter 20, the most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about God's grace. What is that good news? It's that God loves you. It's that he's not a distant, far away God who wants to smite you. He's a close and intimate God who wants to know you, who wants to love you, who wants to see your face, to see you, and for you to see him. He cares about you. You know, I want to share one last scene from the movie Wonder where I just think it's a beautiful picture. It's my favorite scene, a beautiful picture of how the Father God loves and sees us. Augie and his dad are getting ready for graduation. Augie's made it through the school year, and uh, he's lost his space helmet, though. He lost it about halfway through the movie, and he's about to find out where it's been. Would you watch this clip with me?
friend, you need to hear this. God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. God sees you as you are. He doesn't care about all the crap in your life. He doesn't care about all the gunk and the mistakes. and He doesn't care about it. He loves you just the way you are. He loves you. Why? Because he cares about you. He wants a relationship with you. Mm, you need to hear this, that friend, God actually doesn't want to be your God. He wants to be your father. It's not a religion, it's a relationship he wants to have with you. Arms open wide. He wants you. He wants to receive you. And we just have to step into it. Let's close our service by praying. Would you bow your heads wherever you are? Well, Holy Spirit, God, I just invite you to wherever every person is in the world watching, Lord, that you would be there with them right now and make them aware of your presence. Holy Spirit, they don't need me. They need you, Jesus. They need you. So, Lord, would you be with them? We're all on a spiritual journey. So where, whatever your next step is, you, you know what it is. For some of you, you haven't, COVID knocked you off your routine and you haven't been serving and, and, you know, you're called to be serving. That's a part of your calling. Whether it's online or in church, you can do it safely. You've been knocked off your routine with your, with your uh, Bible reading and praying and spending time with the Lord. Take that step. Get back into that habit. For some of you, it's growth track. If you haven't been to growth track. For some of you, it's leading a small group, starting to actually get real friends, authentic relationships. Whatever it is, you, you know it. God will make you aware of it. You need to take that step. Move towards all that God has for you. And for some of you, that's beginning a relationship with Jesus. For, by the grace of God, the spirit of revelation has worked in you in this service and has made you aware that you're now in a place where you're ready to take that step. If that's you, I want to pray with you right where you are. I'm going to lead you through a prayer. And if I'm describing you, maybe you've known the Lord before you've prayed to accept Jesus before, but you've fallen away, you've stepped away from Jesus. Well, it's time to come back, my friend. It's time to come back. So what I want you to do is I want you, without hesitation, if you're going to pray this prayer with me, what I want you to do is I want you to click that button that says, I raise my hand. You're making a decision to pray this prayer with me. Go ahead, click that button. It's anonymous, nobody's going to know. But I want you to make a move towards God, and he'll move in your life in a powerful way. Would you pray with me now? If, if you raised your hand, would you pray with me? Would you say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for paying for my sin. Thank you for paying my bill. Today I receive what you did and I surrender my life to you. Now say this with me. Lord, be number one in my life. I give you control. I surrender myself to you. Be my father. I'm going to follow you and serve you with everything I have. Come live inside of me and change me. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, I'm so proud of you, those who prayed that prayer with me. That is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. If you did pray that prayer with me, I want you to go ahead and text this number and text no God if you prayed that prayer with me. Here's why. One, I want to pray over you. Our pastoral team prays over those who make this decision every day. Prayer is powerful, my friend. The second thing is not so we can come visit you or fly to wherever you are and check, hey, it's me. No, we want to send you a letter that gives you some next steps you can take, some, some immediate next steps you can take after making that decision. If you want to text this number and text pray, we have a prayer team that would love to pray for you in, in any way we can. Hey, we have our Christmas series starting next week. Christmas is already here. If you didn't notice the Christmas trees behind me, Christmas is here. <laughs> and hey, if you haven't had an unchurched person in church with you yet, if you haven't invited somebody to an online experience with Vineyard, Now's the time. Invite them to a Christmas service. You know, we have our Christmas, actual Eve services, our Christmas services. It's all in December every weekend. But then we do a special Christmas service that will be 
provided for the online campus as well on these dates and these times. Invite somebody. Invite somebody. Partner in the process. God wants you to be a part of it. And then finally, we're going to close with some ways to give. Hey, if you're visiting or you just landed on this page for whatever reason, somehow, somebody invited you, don't feel any pressure at all to participate in this part. This is for those who call Vineyard their home. Vineyard Church is their home, and they jump in. And we give, not because we have to, we get to. And we love watching how God works. You know, we just had our outreach team feed over 100 families Thanksgiving meals, and that's because of our church's generosity. I love pastoring a generous church, so thank you. Well, let me close in prayer, and then I will let you guys go. In the name of Jesus Christ, I just pray a covering of health and protection over every person watching. Wherever they are, Lord, would you uh, remind them of your presence, remind them of your love, and Lord, uh, I specifically lift up in prayer those who prayed that uh, to sit the prayer with me today to, to accept you as their father. Lord, may their lives never be the same and may they continue to grow in intimacy with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I will see you next weekend.